Welcome to the deep dive, where we really try to extract the fascinating core from the information you need. That's the goal. Today, we're peering into, well, the vibrant world of medically important bacteria. We're focusing on something that sounds simple, but is actually remarkably informative, their colony morphology. Exactly. And for those of you listening who are uh, delving into medicine or medical laboratory science, think of this as sharpening your initial observational skills. Seriously important. Okay. We're going to explore how the naked eye appearance, you know, how bacterial communities look on a culture plate, offers these crucial first line clues in identifying microbes. It really does sound like being a microbial detective, doesn't it? Before you even reach for the complex tests, the bacteria themselves are giving you visual hints. So our goal today is to decode these signals. We're drawing insights from some key resources. Right, we've got medical microbiology, a guide to microbial infections. Right. Also, district laboratory practice in tropical countries, parts one and two, and that wonderfully clear one, clinical microbiology made ridiculously simple. Great sources. So uh, let's kick things off. What exactly is colony morphology? What are we talking about here? Okay, at its heart, colony morphology is the macroscopic appearance. That means what you can actually see with your own eyes. Right. It's the look of a whole population of bacteria growing together on a solid surface, usually an agar plate in a petri dish. It's the collective mass. Ah, okay. So this isn't about looking at an individual bacterium under a microscope. No, not at this stage. We're observing the characteristics of the entire colony, that visible lump or spot that millions or billions of bacterial cells have formed. Got it. And these colonies show a range of, you said, telling features? They do. Several fundamental characteristics we look for. First, there's the size. Are the colonies just tiny specks, pinpoint? Or do they grow larger, maybe even spread out? Okay, size. Then the shape. Are they nice and round, perfectly circular? Or are they irregular? Maybe even filamentous, sort of branching out. Size and shape, pretty straightforward so far. What else? The margin. That's the edge of the colony. That gives us information too. Is it smooth, continuous? We call that entire. Oh, entire, okay. Or does it have a wavy look that's undulate? Maybe distinct lobes, lobate, or even fine hair-like threads coming off filamentous. Wow, okay. Lots of options for the edge. And then there's elevation. How does the colony actually rise up from the agar? Is it flat, just slightly raised? Yeah. Does it form a distinct dome, which we call convex? Convex. Or maybe it has a little bump in the middle, like a belly button umbinate or even sunk in the center like a tiny crater, crater reform. Huh. It really does sound like you're describing a tiny landscape, a topographical map of microbes. It kind of is. Mm -hmm. We also look at the texture. Is the colony surface smooth, maybe glistening, mm -hmm. or is it rough and dull? Mm -hmm. Sometimes they look really slimy and wet. It's mucoid. Or they could be dry and brittle. Texture, right. And color. You mentioned pigment. Yes, pigment is crucial. Does the colony have an inherent color? Some bacteria naturally produce pigments, mm -hmm. staining their colonies yellow, red, green, you name it. And that could be a really big clue. Like those color plates you see in books like District Laboratory Practice, they really help visualize the different pathogens based on color sometimes. Exactly those. They highlight how pigmentation can be a key identifier. Yeah. And uh, while it's not always formally written down in the description, yeah. experienced microbiologists might also notice a characteristic odor. Some bacteria produce quite distinctive smells. Interesting, okay, what else? And finally, if we're growing them on blood agar, which is very common, we look for hemolysis. That's their ability to break down red blood cells. Ah, yes, alpha, beta, and gamma hemolysis, the different ways they affect the red blood cells. Correct, alpha is partial lysis, mm. often looks greenish. Beta is complete clearing, a clear zone around the colony. Mm. And gamma means no hemolysis at all. So let's connect that. Imagine you do a gram stain, you see gram-positive cocci, then you grow them on blood agar. Right. And you see that clear halo, that beta hemolysis around the colonies. What does that suggest? Well, a prime suspect would immediately be Streptococcus pyogenes, the bug that causes strep throat. That combination of gram stain and beta hemolysis is a classic pointer, often shown in diagrams like in plate 25 of district laboratory practice, for instance. Okay, so we're building this visual profile. It makes sense. But why is this initial look, this colony morphology assessment, so critical in the clinical lab? Why not just jump straight to the fancier tests? Because observing colony morphology is often the very first step. It's rapid, it's cost effective, and it acts like an immediate sorting mechanism. It lets the lab professionals quickly narrow down the huge range of possibilities. Think of it as um, visual triage. Visual triage, I like that. A quick look gives you a lot of direction. It really does. 
The macroscopic features can help distinguish between different genera, those broad categories of bacteria. Sometimes, it can even strongly suggest a particular species. So it guides the next steps. Absolutely. This initial observation is critical for deciding which follow-up tests are needed. You know, the more specific, often more time-consuming or expensive tests. You wouldn't run every possible test on every sample. Morphology helps you focus your efforts intelligently. That makes perfect sense. Lab efficiency is key. Yeah. So let's get into some specific examples. You mentioned size. How variable is that? Size can be quite variable, yeah. It can even depend on the growth medium and how long you incubate it. But just as a general guide, say, after overnight incubation on Macaque agar. Okay. E. coli colonies are typically pretty small, maybe 0.1 to 0.5 millimeters across. Mm -hmm. Other bacteria, same conditions, might form much larger colonies, maybe spreading out more. We use terms like pinpoint, small, medium, large to describe these differences. Right. And shape. You brought up Mycobacterium tuberculosis earlier with those serpentine cords. That sounds distinctive. Oh, it is. M. tuberculosis has a really striking morphology, yeah. especially if you grow it in liquid broth. Like you see in figures in medical microbiology, they often form these tightly wound rope-like clumps, serpentine cords. Wow. And it's not just a random look, it's directly tied to the waxy mycolic acids in their cell walls, which makes them stick together like that. Serpentine cords, so the appearance is linked directly to the cell structure. Fascinating. What about margin and elevation? Are there specific bugs known for, say, a wavy edge or a dome shape? Well, maybe less definitively diagnostic just on their own compared to something like pigment or hemolysis. Oh, wow. But the margin and elevation definitely add to the overall picture. They help differentiate bacteria that might otherwise look similar. Okay. For instance, you know, one species might typically have a smooth entire margin, while a related one might usually be more irregular or lobate. Same with elevation flat versus raised versus convex. That's another piece of visual data. Texture and pigment seem like they could be really obvious differentiators sometimes. They certainly can be. Some bacteria produce a lot of capsule material, this slimy outer layer, right, which makes the colonies look smooth, glistening, really mucoid. Others might have a drier surface, so the colony looks rougher, maybe matte. And pigment production, yeah, that's often the big clue. Many colonies are just whitish or cream colored. But some species make these really vibrant pigments, yellows, reds, greens, even purples or blacks sometimes. That can be a strong pointer. You mentioned McConkie agar earlier. How does the specific type of agar plate influence what you see and help identify the bacteria? Uh, that's a really key point. We use selective and differential media for exactly this reason. They're designed cleverly. How so? Well, selective means they encourage certain bacteria to grow while inhibiting others. Differential means they allow us to visually distinguish between the bacteria that do grow, usually based on their metabolism, how they break down nutrients in the agar. And this often shows up in their colony appearance. So the plate itself acts like a filter and a visual test strip. Exactly. Take McConkie agar again. It has lactose, the sugar, and a pH indicator dye. Now, enterobacteriaceae like E. coli, enterobacter, Klebsiella, they can ferment lactose. Okay. When they do, they produce acid. This acid changes the pH indicator in the agar, making their colonies turn pink or red. Uh huh. But bacteria like Salmonella, Shigella, Proteus, they can't ferment lactose. So they grow, but their colonies stay colorless or maybe pale yellow. It's a really clear visual split, mm -hmm. super helpful for looking at gut bacteria or stool samples. Yeah, that's a fantastic visual shortcut. What about mannitol salt agar? I remember that being important for staff. Yes, exactly. Mannitol salt agar, or MSA, it's selective because it has a really high salt concentration. Right. And most bacteria can't handle that much salt, but Staphylococcus species usually can. Yeah. Then it's differential because it contains mannitol, a type of sugar alcohol, and again, a pH indicator. And Staph aureus uses the mannitol. Staphylococcus aureus ferments mannitol, produces acid, and turns the indicator yellow around its colonies. Most other staph species that might grow don't ferment mannitol, so the agar stays pink. So growth plus yellow color change is a strong suggestion it's S. aureus. Clever. And CLED agar, you mentioned that for UTIs. Yes, CLED agar, that stands for cysteine lactose electrolyte deficient. As district laboratory practice points out, it's commonly used for urine cultures. It lets most urinary pathogens grow, and it differentiates based on lactose fermentation again. So yellow colonies versus 
blue-green. Right. Lactose fermenters turn yellow. Non-fermenters are usually blue or green because of the indicator used in CLED. It gives a quick idea of what might be causing a urinary tract infection. So these different media really provide tailored environments and visual cues. What about those fussier bacteria like streptococcus pneumonia or Haemophilus influenza? Good question. Those are what we call fastidious organisms. They're picky eaters, basically. Need richer food. Exactly. They need enriched media, like chocolate agar, which is essentially gently heated blood agar or blood agar itself, to grow well. And even on blood agar, we can do simple differential tests right on the plate. Like the Optichun test for strep pneumo. Precisely. Streptococcus pneumonia is sensitive to a chemical called Optichin. So you place a little paper disc soaked in Optichin onto the blood agar where you've streaked the bacteria. If it's estimonia, you'll see a clear zone around the disc where growth has been inhibited. That's a key diagnostic feature. This really paints a picture of how colony morphology, combined with the right media and maybe a simple disc test, forms this powerful first line of investigation. It absolutely does. But, but we can't just stop there, right? We can't rely only on what we see. No, absolutely not. That's a critical point. While colony morphology gives us invaluable initial clues, narrows things down, it's rarely enough for a definitive final ID on its own. Why not? Because different species, sometimes even different genera, can occasionally look surprisingly similar on the plate. There can be overlaps and ambiguities. So appearances can be deceiving, even in the microbial world. They definitely can be. Yeah. You almost always need further confirmatory tests. Things like biochemical tests, seeing what sugars they ferment, what enzymes they produce. Okay. Or serological tests looking for specific antigens on their surface. Mm -hmm. And increasingly, molecular tests looking directly at their DNA or RNA. Morphology points you in the right direction, but these other methods give you the certainty. Got it. Now, we talked about the serpentine cords of M. tuberculosis and how that relates to their cell wall. Are there other cases where how a colony looks might hint at, you know, how dangerous it is, its virulence factors? Yes, sometimes there are interesting connections. Sticking with M. tuberculosis for a second, those mycolic acids that cause the cording, they don't just affect morphology, they're crucial for the bacteria resisting our immune system and some antibiotics. Oh, okay, so it's linked to pathogenicity. Directly. Another example, maybe a bit more subtle, involves an anaerobic bacterium called Prevotella melaninogenica. You find it in mouth infections, other places. Under UV light, sometimes the colonies, or even the pus from an infection site, can show this distinctive brick red fluorescence that's linked to specific pigments they produce porphyrins, which might actually contribute to tissue damage. Wow, brick red fluorescence. So sometimes these visual traits are more than just skin deep. They're tied to the mechanisms of infection itself. Exactly. They can be subtle visual hints about the underlying biology and the pathogenic potential of the organism you're looking at. This has been a really, really illuminating deep dive. The world of bacterial colony morphology is surprisingly rich. So for our listeners, especially those heading into medicine or lab science, what's the main takeaway message? I think the crucial thing to understand is that colony morphology isn't just, you know, an old-fashioned technique. It's a foundational, indispensable first step in identifying bacteria. Right. It provides so much readily available information, valuable clues that they guide everything else you do diagnostically. So train your eyes. Really learn to observe these seemingly simple visual characteristics. They can tell you a remarkable amount. Absolutely, and I think you really get those aha moments when you see a particular colony type and it just clicks with what you know about a certain pathogen. It solidifies the learning. But as you stressed, always remember it's just one piece of the puzzle. Precisely. It needs to be integrated with other lab techniques, biochemical, serological, molecular, to get that accurate, reliable final diagnosis. Couldn't agree more. So on that note, here's a final thought for you all to ponder. Given the absolutely immense diversity out there in the bacterial kingdom, what other subtle visual cues, things maybe not even in the standard textbooks, might really experienced microbiologists be using, maybe even subconsciously, in their initial assessments? It's a whole universe down there. It really is. And we hope this deep dive into colony morphology, crafted especially for you, the students at Aladdin Creations, has given you a clear, engaging, and uh, hopefully insightful look at this essential microbiological principle. Until our next exploration, keep observing.